Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Protect Your Home webinar this evening. Um, we're getting started and we're gonna give everyone a chance to enter the room. So we'll get started in a few minutes. Okay. okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Protect Your Home, Recognize and Avoid Scams. And we know scam is a big part of everything that is happening in our day-to-day -day life. So we definitely would like to bring this to you. My name is Angela Davidson. I am the program director here at NHS Brooklyn, and I will be your moderator for tonight. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for really taking time out of your busy schedule. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so again, my name is Angela Davidson. I'm the program director here. With me tonight, I have Mr. Peter White, who will be our presenter tonight. He is a staff attorney at Brooklyn Volunteer Lawyers Project. And of course, with me is Ms. Luz Torres, our own housing counselor here at NHS Brooklyn, working with our foreclosure intervention um, program. A little housekeeping. We're gonna ask you to please post your questions in the Q&A box. And we, throughout the webinar, will get to your questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer all questions by the end of the webinar. If we're not able to do so, we will definitely um, get your question answered and send out an email with the, the answers if we have your information. So that being said, we are going to provide a snapshot survey at the end of the webinar. We're asking you to please fill out that snapshot and um, help us to make our webinars better, right? You filling out that snapshot will give us ideas of what went right, what went wrong, things you, you know, topics you would like to learn and um, the question, the answers to your questions. And I know a lot of you have been on our webinars before, but I would be amiss if I did not introduce who we are. So NHS Brooklyn, who are we and what do we do? So we are a community-based, HUD-approved nonprofit housing counseling agency. We were founded in 1982. Our mission is to create and preserve affordable housing. We are champions of revitalizing underserved neighborhoods. Our emphasis is on education, financial assistance, and community leadership. We enable residents to invest in, preserve, and improve their neighborhoods, homes, and futures. We partner with government and businesses. And, you know, most importantly, we are led by local residents and guided by local needs. Hence why we have these webinars, to address your needs and to hear from you. Um, and so let's talk about some of the programs and services that we have here at NHS Brooklyn. For homeowners, means you have already bought your house and you're a proud homeowner. We provide homeowner education on the following areas. Proper to taxes, um, where we help people to reduce the taxes that they're paying and help them to um, get their taxes assessed on an annual basis, usually around the month of February. If you think you're, tax if you're paying too much taxes, you have the opportunity then to work with Department of Finance to reduce your taxes. And then for other property taxes is to get the exemptions that are out there. And we also provide um, education on homeowners insurance and home maintenance. We administer a home repair loans and grants program here. 
if you need to do repairs on your home, um, you would apply through that program. And of course, we provide mortgage counseling around foreclosure, refinancing, and our robust reverse mortgage um, program. We also have a new program, our property management for small landlords. So if you're a small landlord and you're in need of someone to help to run your business, your business being your property, we, we would help you to collect your rent, deal with your tenants, um, administer repairs. Um, we are here for you in that capacity. And then for tenants and home buyers, we provide tenant counseling. Right, So there are lots of tenants who might be out there having issues or trying to look for housing, whether it's affordable housing or just trying to get an, um, an apartment, we provide counseling in that area. We provide renter's insurance education. You know, everyone needs insurance regardless of whether you're a homeowner or not. So being a renter, uh, having renter's insurance helps to protect your, um, your, your belongings. And of course, we have our home buyer education, which is one of our most popular um, programs here at NHS, where we um, educate people looking to become first time home buyers on the process and also administer that down payment assistant grant. And we have our landlord. And of course, that's for people who are either looking to become a landlord or you are already a landlord and you need to know the processes around your responsibilities as a landlord. And then for the entire everyone, right? We provide financial education where we provide um, people with coaching around credit improvement, financial products, just talk to, talking to you about just your overall finances and how to maintain proper financial etiquette. And we also have a program dealing with emergency and disaster preparedness. As you know, Hurricane season is coming up. So that is one of the areas that we will be having a webinar on so that people know what they're supposed to do in the event of an emergency and how to be prepared for that. We have two offices, although both are temporarily closed. Our one office is in East Flatbush at 2806 Church Avenue. And our other office is in Canarsie at 9701 Avenue L. We are closed, but you know we are still here working remotely. And so if you need to contact us, you can contact us by calling us at 718-469-4679. Or we encourage you to also visit our website, www.nhsbrooklyn.org, you will find um, valu valuable, valuable information on our website, talks about events that are coming up and just reading all through our programs. You'll see our newsletter. You will see you know, all the things that we're doing. And, and if you have a question, send it to us at info at nhsbrooklyn.org. And so tonight, without further ado, you know, we know that Scam is a big part of, um, you know, bad actors and just, just just lots of scams happening in our communities. And so tonight we have Mr. Peter White, who is a staff attorney at Brooklyn Volunteer Lawyers Project. And he's going to talk to us tonight about the different scams, how to recognize them and how to avoid them. Although we are going to be talking about scams in general, our focus tonight really is going to be centered around detect and any any kind of theft around real estate. And so without further ado, I'd like to um, ask Mr. Peter White to take over. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Peter White. I'm a staff attorney at the Brooklyn Bar Association Volunteer Lawyers Project. I work primarily in the areas of foreclosure defense uh, and consumer bankruptcy, including chapter seven bankruptcy and chapter 13 bankruptcy, we well, actually worked on bankruptcies with both Ms. Torres um, and Ms. Davidson um, here. Uh, we, we also, well, and I also uh, coordinate a uh, clinic at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to help homeowners uh, with the Department of Buildings violations. So we provide pretty comprehensive um, service, legal services to homeowners. Um, but uh, first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our organization. Uh, we were founded in 1990 to address the overwhelming need for legal services 
um, for low, in, uh, low income residents in Brooklyn. We provide high quality direct legal representation, as I just stated. Uh, we provide advice and counsel for, the, for those we can help uh, in, in direct representation capacities. Uh, we provide community education through, throughout Brooklyn, which I'm clearly doing right now. And then also uh, we work with a number of volunteers, whether they be solo practitioners or attorneys at big firms, uh, to assist uh, to assist our, our, our various clients in, uh, in different practice areas. Um, and then we, we work to exclusively uh, solve civil legal problems affecting um, people's fundamental rights and access to the legal system. Um, we work in the areas of family law. Uh, this area encompasses custody, visitation, and child support. We help individuals with uncontested divorces, uh, 17 a guardianship. Uh, we also work in the areas of elder law. So think of wills, uh, state law, guardianship, uh, power of attorney. We also help in consumer, uh, consumer law. So as I stated, I, I work in the areas of chapter seven and chapter 13 bankruptcy, but we also help individuals uh, at, uh, at King's civil court um, with, with their individual consumer consumer cases, so think credit cards, uh, you know, charge accounts, uh, other consumer credit cases, um, and and we do that through uh, a program called Claro, and then also we have a program called Volunteer Lawyer for the Day, whereby attorneys, uh, our our in-house attorneys, and also volunteer attorneys come in and represent um, individuals with, with consumer credit cases and in, 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 in their legal cases. And then we have a foreclosure intervention program, which uh, encompasses myself and two other attorneys. Um, how do we work generally? We screen clients for eligibility. Uh, generally, uh, an individual or family uh, cannot make any more than two times uh, the federal poverty level. So there's a federal poverty guideline. That's a little bit different for foreclosure because you need a little bit more money, obviously, to own a home in New York City. Um, like I said, we, we take cases in house. We recruit pro bono attorneys that help us with long-term cases, but also uh, with clinics uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we conduct trainings and other continuing legal education uh, seminars to, 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 to train law students and other attorneys in the particular areas in which we work. Um, we provide templates and other resources for pro bono attorneys that may have taken a case in which they may, they may have not worked in previously. And uh, we also uh, supervise these attorneys, uh, the, these volunteer attorneys to help us with our cases. Um, and we have a robust foreclosure intervention program that assists homeowners at risk of foreclosure through uh, pretty holistic legal assistance. Uh, the program provides direct legal representation. Um, we assist pro se litigants through three walk-in clinics that we're currently not having at the present time because of the COVID pandemic. We're actually not back in office yet. Uh, we're working remotely. Uh, we provide financial counseling uh, and we conduct community outreach, like I said before, and we, uh, we, we mentor uh, pro bono attorneys that assist us with these cases. So tonight I'm going to talk with you all um, about deed scams in Brooklyn. Um, this is actually uh, a pretty hot button issue um, considering uh, obviously home values are, are, are way up in Brooklyn. Next slide, please. So despite the fact that we're in a pandemic, uh, home values are on the rise again. Uh, they, they continue to go up, especially in the Eastern parts of Brooklyn. So you, know, you think of you know, Canarsie, East New York, Brownville, Bed-Stuy, uh, traditional black and brown communities. Um, but even before the pandemic, over the last 15 odd years or so, since about 2008, 2009, home values, home, home values in general have doubled in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, I look at some of my clients, they purchased homes uh, maybe in Bed-Stuy in 1998, or you know, in some point in the 90s for 100 or 150 thousand dollars. Now you look at the values of these homes. You know, 1.6 million dollars, 2.6 million dollars, um, and, and that's very common these days. So, according to statistics, uh, statistics that I looked up, um, the average sale price in Brooklyn during the first quarter of 2021, so still during the pandemic, 
was uh, over $1 million, right? And the median sale price is $900,000. I actually think the New York Times asked a bunch of mayoral candidates this question a few weeks ago. And uh, one, one got it right, and then another one, another one was close. But um, a, a lot of other people had no idea. Um, so that kind of shows you what we're, we're dealing with. A lot of people don't understand um, how, how grave the situation is, especially for working class people in Brooklyn. Um, and these numbers are, are even up from, um, from a few months before that, so the last quarter of 2020, in which um, the average sale price was about um, um, uh, $1,055,000 and it was and the median price was about eight hundred and seventy five thousand dollars so um, that, that 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 seems a little odd, but no, home values are still going up in brooklyn and the sell the number of sales have gone up as well, which also seems pretty counterintuitive because we're in a pandemic and you hear about all these people leaving new york city um, but sell, sales have gone up, so sales have gone up um uh, four point. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, four point seven percent from from now going back into the fourth quarter of 2020. So went up four point seven percent. But since the beginning of 2020, so right before the pandemic, um, home home. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, sales have gone up eleven point eight percent. So that's a pretty drastic increase, right? Um, and these were the highest number of transactions at the beginning of this year. Highest number of transactions in Brooklyn in 14 years though Brooklyn has continued to be a hotbed um, uh, of real estate activity. But condos have also gone up 15.9% um, uh, uh, since the beginning of 2021 and about 34% since uh, the first quarter of 2020. So we're, we're seeing all around increase. Now, the purchase of one to three family homes has decreased um, a, a little bit, but but still, that that that's not enough to impede this growth. So how does it, how does this affect uh, a deed scam or or the motives of deed scammers, right? Um, because a lot of these affordable homes have seen their values increase. Um, the borough is ripe for fraud. Um, Brooklyn, ac according to uh, the Center for an Urban Future, 2019, Brooklyn has the highest number of senior citizens of the five boroughs, um, which is, is easy to understand because I think they say Brooklyn is the third largest town uh, in America. So Brooklyn has millions of residents and has millions of senior citizens. And these people are most at risk, them and a lot of uh, working class citizens. So. This, 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 is, this continues to be a problem that we've seen. And um, as I explained, there's actually been legislation put in place to make it easier for people who have been defrauded to, to get their homes back. Um, but a lot of times scammers and real estate investors actually seek these people out and they seek certain neighborhoods out uh, specifically, just like I mentioned Bed-Stuy for, for their practices. Uh, be, because they understand that these are the type of people that live in these areas. And I, and I know many of you have walked around areas in Bed-Stuy, and, and let's, let's face the fact, you can kind of tell who lives in, in, in what home. You can tell when older people live in homes, people who are on fixed incomes. I mean, they don't have the money to you know invest in a half a million dollar facelift of the facade. And you can also tell you know, who their neighbors are that, you know, possibly, you know, maybe had big finance jobs or moved from out of town and they, 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 have, they have a lot of liquidity, have a lot of money because they totally re renovated the premises. And if anyone can tell that walking down the street, clearly scammers and fraudsters can determine that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all right, so I'm gonna explain the basics of, uh, of deed scams and fraud, but, before I get into that, uh, I, I just have a little anecdotal evidence of this. So this, this may sound bad, but this, but what I'm about to tell you is uh, about an attorney who actually got arrested for deed fraud, right? So there's an attorney, I'm obviously not gonna mention his name. Um, he was arrested in 2020 for defrauding Brooklyn homeowners out of $8 million in property. $8 million, around eight homes, they said. 
And he was actually disbarred in 2012 after scamming his uncle out of $600,000. And he, he, got, he was arrested in 2017 for scamming people in Queens. So he kind of just moved his base of operations from Queens over to Brooklyn. But what he would do, though he didn't have a license, he would tell people that he would get loan modifications for them or help them save their homes. He would have them sign paperwork, have them sign a deed over to him. And then he would rent the home, he would rent these homes out actually. It, so let's say the, the current tenants, he would say, hey, I'm the new owner. He would collect rent from them. But also he would rent the homes out to new tenants. So, and, and basically wait until the home is foreclosed on and, you know, well, not skip town, but, you know, sk- you know, leave the situation. And he actually collected over $600,000 uh, in the process of doing that. So as you can see, I mean, this is the fraud. I mean, it's a big money business and that's why it's very important to protect yourselves. Uh, and I'll explain that later on. But I mean, not only did he get the properties, but he collected over $600,000 in hard cash. Um, so that, that gives you a little bit more insight into people's motives. So uh, just to start, so what is a deed scam or, <clears throat> or what is deed fraud, right? So it occurs when one files a transfer of uh, property without that person's consent to another party, generally uh, a corporation or an LLC because you can't exactly track who did it, or when somebody mistakenly signs uh, their deed over. So, you know, a situation in which someone goes to your house and says, you know, sign, you know, all this paperwork. And a lot of people, they don't know what it is. Uh, some people have uh, limited, Eng- you know, English pro- proficiency a lot, you know, may- maybe people, so- some people also um, may be cognitively impaired. Um, it, it, it happens. And they'll sign all this paperwork over. And one of these documents is a deed. Um, and then these counterfeit deeds, they use them to commit other fraudulent activities, right? So let's say you have tenants in the home. They'll go to the tenant and they'll say, hey, this person doesn't own a home anymore. Look at this deed. I own it. Pay the rent to me. Or if, or if people have a vacant, u- uh, vacant unit, which is very common in New York City because people, a lot of people have one to three family homes. That's just how they come. And they have a vacant unit. They'll put somebody in there and they'll milk it until the home is foreclosed or if the home is paid off, they'll just keep milking it, right? So they're found out. Um, they'll set up a, short, uh, a, a phony short sale or a traditional sale, whether it's just sell it to what's called a bona fide purchaser. So think of, you know, the couple coming from Ohio, wanting to move to bed They have no idea. They just know the person selling the home. They buy it, you know, for $1.5 million and this person skips town. Um, and, and as I said before, they'll rent the property. Um, and something that's very important to understand, deed frauds and scams do occur when individuals uh, receive money. So I have a situation, so I, I also have uh, a, a personal situation like this. I had a client before and she wanted someone to get a modification for, uh, but she couldn't get one. And what she did, she transferred the, the deed into the person's name because he said, okay, well, your credit's bad. You're maybe not making enough income. You're in foreclosure. Transfer it to me. I'll handle it. I'll do the modification for you. I'll transfer it back. But, you know, to make sure that no one finds out or make sure that, no, you know, the, the bank doesn't, uh, you know, look into it, I'll give you $19,000. Gave her $19,000. Never transferred the home back. This lady got a loan modification. Uh, the lower name wasn't on the deed. She had to explain it to the bank. And then um, we had to fight, you know, to, to try to get the home back. But the thing is, she received $19,000. But when you have a home that's worth half a million dollars, that is still fraud because they're, he, 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 he stripped her equity. He rented out the home, started collecting rent. And, uh, you know, he made much more than $19,000 back. He, he probably made double. So, you know, this was a good invest, a quote unquote investment on his part. Um, and also, and, and this lady, uh, like I said before, um, you know, about other people, this lady was vulnerable. She was in foreclosure. She didn't know what to do. Uh, she was an immigrant. She, she worked hard to, you know, pay for the home, but she didn't understand, um, like many people, you know, like many smart people, uh, she didn't understand the complexities and in, in the, in the, in, in, in the rules of fraud, uh, you know, 
taking out a mortgage and, uh, and also what to do when you uh, default on that mortgage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, before you move forward, Peter, I just okay. want to ask the question based on um, the monetary part of things. You know, we have heard that if someone takes money and sign their deed over, they practically sign their deed away. Is there a time that that person could actually get that home back, although they have taken money? Yes. So generally, uh, and I'll break it down like this. If let's say if it's an outright, if, if it's outright fraud, someone just, you know, forges your name or whatever. Uh, a lot of times what people do, just go to the attorney general's office and, and, and they may take it from there. But the thing is, attorney general is less likely to take a situation in, someone, in which someone received money. So uh, what I would suggest um, and, and tell people to do, uh, hire, hire counsel, hire a civil attorney, because what will happen and what they should do is file a case on your behalf against the, uh, the, the fraudulent party. So they will file what, what we like to call an order to show cause. And all that means is you, it's basically paperwork the attorney fills out saying, uh, you know, they file it with the court and they basically say, hey, judge, look at us, look at this situation. We need our day in court in an expedient manner. We have to get in court very quickly. And they'll, and, and basically the attorney will take it over to the court, uh, get a date in front of a judge and say, hey, judge, we need what's, what we like to call a temporary restraining order. What is, what is a temporary restraining order? That means that they can, the fraud the fraudster cannot do anything with the property because let's say they uh, the, the fraudulent party says oh wow they got an attorney oh I'm going to be in big trouble uh, pretty soon so what they'll try to do is okay sell the property off quickly and then skip town and then they won't be able to get the property back but when you ask the judge for a temporary restraining order you say hey judge stop them from doing anything with respect to this property till we get this all sorted out. And most judges, especially, you know, if the attorney's papers are decent, they lay out a uh, good factual scenario, they'll sign it and they'll give a new court date and they'll stop uh, the fraudulent party from doing anything else with the property. And at that point, it proceeds like a normal court case. Um, and, and, but that's what I recommend people do. And uh, if you if you get an attorney that works in that area, they should know know what to do right off the bat. And, okay. and so I'm, what, I'm glad you. I'm sorry. I, I'm glad that you mentioned attorney. Um, and I, I wanted just to to highlight that if you can tell us what a homeowner who is seeking counsel should be asking, the question should be asking before they hire an attorney. And what, what are things, what type of attorney would be able to handle this situation? And really um, what should be their objective? Um, in other words, a lot of individuals who do come to us that have been victims of attorneys, and I'm sure um, some of the victims from your, your story would probably say is what were the red flags? What were those things that, you know, may have had may, may may have changed the outcome if you knew beforehand what things should you look out for um and what what should you hold them accountable to okay well uh, first of all to uh, i guess to answer your first uh question or set of questions um when looking for an attorney uh to help one with deed fraud it's generally going to be the foreclosure attorneys or it's going to be the real estate litigators, not maybe the people who do closings for you. I mean, you know, people do a, a number of things, but real estate litigators. Um, so I know just like my organization, the VLP, and then also there, there, there are a number of other organizations, legal services organizations throughout the city that do this type of work. And um, you, you, need to, you need to go to someone like that or, or, a, or a private attorney that has done this type of work before. Um, and, and that should be your second question. Have you done this type of work before? Do you know what to do on day one? After looking at my facts, do you know what to do on day one? And if they don't have a clear answer, if, if, if they can not tell you, okay, we need to draft papers, run over to the court and essentially stop stop any anything else happening with the home, then um, then they may not be the, the right people for you. Because um, what people also, uh, and, and most people who, who aren't in the field, uh, they fail to understand. I mean, lawyers are like doctors, right? I mean, you're not going to go to a foot doctor for, 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 for heart surgery, right? 
you're going to fu- you're you're going to go to specialists in that field. Just like if someone comes to me and they have com- a complex criminal case, I'm going to say no. I'm not touching that case with a ten foot pole because I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to refer them over to a different attorney that does know what uh, he or she is doing. And, and, and that's the most important thing. I mean, and, and what do they always say, right? Smart people know what they don't know. So if an attorney says, oh, yeah, I can do this and this and this, and it, and it sounds like, um, you know, a, a load of horse manure, and they really can't give you a straight answer, that's probably not the attorney for you. And um and you have to be very cognizant of that because um, when dealing with deed scams and deed frauds, uh, you're dealing with time sensitive matters. Um, so one last question on that and we ha- we move forward. If someone cannot afford an attorney, are there attorneys in the courts that can guide someone through the process, the documents like for the order to show cause? Would there be someone in the courts that could guide them in filling out that? document and um, filing it? So, well, I mean, now there, there, there's no one in, physically in the courts, yeah, but no, uh, yeah. <laughs> as, as you know, um, but the thing is, um, what I would suggest is reaching out to a legal services provider. I mean, some organizations are bigger than others. I have a small organization, but they're like other organizations. Uh, they deal with this stuff um, on, on, on a regular basis. Um, most of the times, I'll tell you this though, most of the times uh, it, it should be a situation in which you find an attorney to represent you um, because generally these types of cases, they're not uh, like maybe some foreclosure cases where it's uh, you know, a one size fits all mentality uh, because you have so many types of deeds, scams and frauds, which I'm actually gonna get to in, in, into later. But there are uh, so many types of deeds, scams or frauds. An attorney has to thoroughly look over your situation, determine the facts and, and then present that case, uh, you know, in, in front of a judge. Because, um, I mean, just like, you know, if it was if it was me and, you know, maybe I Google some stuff online, I'm not going to go and perform, you know, foot surgery on an NBA athlete. Uh, you know, you're going to get someone, you know, who, know who, who knows what they're doing with this. Uh, but these, you know, these, these, these issues are very sensitive. Um, but... I mean, you know, hopefully people, you know, in these situations, especially some of the most egregious ones, uh, can find attorneys to represent them. And I know there are a lot of enthusiastic attorneys, uh, you know, try to, trying to right wrongs in Brooklyn and, and throughout this, uh, the city, uh, you know, through the context of legal services. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, so you hear it here. You might have been someone who has been scammed out of your deed. All is not lost. I know we have had um, homeowners who came to us and said, I went to the district attorney's office, I went to the attorney general's office, and they're doing nothing for us. So you hear Mr. White say, it's the possibility to get an attorney, you can possibly get your deed and your home back. So do please reach out to us if, you, if you're if you someone with a question, and we can guide you to one of the legal service providers that will be able to assist you. Mr. White, continue, sir. Okay, so now I'm going to get into some common types of deed scams. Um, and, and just before that, I just want to mention uh, that, so actually, uh, luckily, Governor Cuomo signed into law what's called the Montgomery Weinstein Deed Theft Bill uh, in 2019. And this bill does a number of things. And actually, this bill addresses some of the common types of deed scams that you see on the TV. Number one, it prohibits abusive and deceptive behaviors, such as pretending to be law enforcement or government representatives taking temporary ownership of the deeds. So, you know, you think of the classic situation of, I'm not adverse possession, but, uh, but um, oh, you, basically, you know, when, uh, so, sorry, having a brain freeze. Basically, you know, when the city takes your home, uh, you know, to, to, to use it for uh, to use it for different purposes. I don't know. Let's say they need to build a, new, a you know a new train line, um, a train line or, 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 or something. Right. Like that. Eminent mm-hmm. domain. Yeah, eminent, eminent domain. domain. Yeah, it was on yeah. the tip of my tongue. Eminent domain. Thank you very much. See, we're, we're a great team. We work together. Um, so you know, eminent domain type situations, right? Um, and you know, people send letters and all this stuff uh, to people's homes, especially people they see as uh, more vulnerable and, uh, and, you know, try to get to them to do these things. Uh, also, uh, it eliminates the need to post a bond to file a lawsuit to stop a deed transfer. 
So, uh, you know, previously, uh, let's say, a, a, you know, a deed transfer you know, would occur. People file paperwork in court to stop the deed transfer from occurring because they're alleging fraud. And the court would uh, make people post uh, a bond. So you would have to, you know, go get a bond or, or essentially pay money into the court to stop it while the court figured out exactly what's going on. They eliminated that because, let's face it, most people don't have liquidity like that to post a bond in the court. Um, and then it also uh, prohibits uh, loan consultants from requiring upfront uh, fees, or, uh, I'm sorry, loan modification consultants from requiring uh, upfront fees. And actually, um, loan mod consultants, uh, I'm sorry, to be a loan mod consultant or to actually do a loan modification for people for money, you, you actually have to be a licensed attorney. Um, but most of the people you find doing loan mods, uh, they're going to be your housing counselor, uh, housing counseling agents, and, uh, agents uh, like Ms. Torres, uh, like Ms. Davidson. Uh, it extends the time for a homeowner to rescind a transaction. It was previously five days uh, pursuant to the Home Equity Theft Prevention Act of 2006. It's been extended to 14 days now. So that means if something happens and, you know, it, you, even if you sell the home, you think there's something fraudulent occurred and you, you go consult an attorney, I don't know, a week later and they say, oh, wow, this is fraud. You can rescind that transaction. You have two weeks to do it. 14 business days. Uh, so that doesn't include Sundays and other state and federal holidays. And then also it provides a clear, most importantly, probably, it provides a clear legal path to restore property title when a conviction of fraud has occurred. That means if the DA find someone uh, find someone guilty of a uh, deed or mortgage fraud um, as in uh, the situation uh, with the ex attorney and they're convicted then basically they just have to file I believe a motion with the court go in front of a judge and uh, and, and and they can issue a referee's deed deeding the property back to a uh, or share a ref yeah I think it's a referee's deed uh, um, uh, issuing the property back to the original homeowner um, so, you know, this is very, um, you know, th th this law is very helpful and it's very important to understand your rights in this context. So like, so like I said before, you know, uh, consult your neighborhood uh, housing counselor, consult an attorney, uh, you know, to figure out any options. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. The common types of these scams. Um, just gonna get into that. Uh, so are you good are you going to speak on all of these or you just want to mention these briefly uh some As, of them yes but i, I have information in uh in, in no, the future fine. slides yeah so i'm just gonna uh you know kind of get into some of them uh, some of the most common ones we say okay great thank you right. so most common one probably foreclosure rescue scam now when i talk about homeowners being vulnerable or at risk it's generally people who are in default, as in they haven't paid their mortgage for a few months, but the bank hasn't started a foreclosure action, or people who are actually in a judicial foreclosure. That means you're in the courts, um, you're not what's called foreclosed upon, as in there hasn't been an auction of your home, but the bank is trying to move to do that, and they're filing the necessary paperwork. And let's face it, people are desperate. They want to keep their homes, especially, you know, a lot of New Yorkers have homes that have been inherited, it's been mom's home, it was, you know, grandma, grandparents' homes, and they really want to keep it in the family. And also, I mean, these homes are worth a lot of money. So uh, what Frosters would do in this situation, just like the situation I described before, say, hey, you're in, for you're in foreclosure, you're probably not going to qualify for a loan modification, your, your income is too low, what they tell you is too low, you can't refinance because you're in foreclosure and your credit's bad. So what do you do? You got to trust me. But, and so what they'll do, they'll uh, have people sign paperwork, giving them the right to represent them or actually signing the deeds over to them. And we see a lot of variations of this type of scam. So a uh, variation is a loan modification specialist. You know, person with the office down the street, they say, hey, I can do a loan modification for you. Oh, the attorney, you know, attorney across town told you it would be $6,000 for a loan modification. I'll do it for two. And I used to work at this big law firm, did them all the time, right? And, you know, this person sounds very convincing. They're cheap, which, you know, a lot of people like, expensive city to live in. They're cheap and you trust them. And they, what they, they do, they get paperwork from you. Say, oh, you know, I submitted, uh, you know, paperwork for a loan modification, but, 
they never get you the modification. They say, oh, the bank rejected your modification. You don't, uh, you, you don't qualify. But I know an investor who will buy your home from you. And these people get kickbacks from it. So pretty, very simple, uh, very simple scheme. Um, another one we see, forensic loan, uh, loan audits. Uh, you know, this is kind of like what I like to call like the secret knowledge uh, scenario. You go to someone, they say they're an accountant or possibly even an attorney, and they say, hey, look, I can get your case dismissed. I have this knowledge. Uh, I have this knowledge based upon the records I've looked up uh, because I did an audit report showing that this, this loan, this mortgage is invalid. So I can take this information. I can talk directly with the bank and get you either a, a discount on your mortgage or I can get the mortgage discharged as in you don't have to pay anything. Um, sounds too good to be true, right? Probably is. There are situations in which attorneys can get mortgages discharged. Um, but the thing is, like I said, consult someone that knows what they're doing um, and has done this before. But generally, you need an attorney to do it. Accountant's not probably not going to get it done. All right. Before you move forward with that, um, Peter, if you go to the previous slide when you referred to the loan modification, um, <laughs> loan scam, um, I just want to add to that that we have seen in our line of work where it, it's not just loan modification specialists; it can also be attorneys that may have um, individuals pay them and keep them for years as clients and nothing has really moved. Um, and so you also want to be aware of that, um, that you've been working with someone and you haven't seen any results. Um, we, wanna, uh, we wanna remind you that you hired the attorney. Therefore, you should be able to ask questions. You should be able to get answers. You should be able to follow up and receive paperwork when um, you, you are in question. Uh, if you've been dealing with an attorney for over two years and nothing's changed, you may want to um, seek out or ask questions um, or maybe do a little research on the person, on the individual. And, and really just reach out to nonprofit organizations and see maybe we can, we can assist you in, in your situation. Yes. All right. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, another common one we see lease back or, reach, uh, or, or the repurchase scam. Um, or, or which feeds into what we call an equity stripping scheme. So there's situations in which, which, which can be legal in which you, you do a uh, lease back or repurchase agreement. So um, you sign the deed over to, to, you know, to someone else and then you agree to buy it back at a, you know, uh, buy it back at a later time for various reasons. Sometimes people are in, like, like I said before, sometimes people are in foreclosure, they sell it off so they can get a new loan to let's say refinance and they get the home back. Um, but what happens is the, the entity that does it with you, they don't follow through and they just keep it. Um, and sometimes they'll even let the homeowner rent the property. They're paying this other entity rent. Um, not, nothing happens. And basically it's, it's a slow march to foreclosure. The, the original homeowner has no idea what's going on and then allows um, the, the, the new person to actually, you know, even strip their equity. They may take out separate loans uh, under a business's name to, you know, get cash out of the property. And then the home gets foreclosed on and, you know, this person's often, or persons or a group, they're off in the wind. Uh, you know, so, so, be, so be very careful about that. Um, there's specific rules um, for, for repurchase agreements. Um, there's also, um, you know, kind of similar to the loan auditors, the mortgage debt elimination scheme. Uh, they, they, the fraudsters claim that they can eliminate or discharge a certain amount of debt, um, which does happen from time to time. It's called what we call in business principal forgiveness. Uh, we used to see it more uh, a number of years ago, maybe four or five years ago, because 
frankly speaking, people had so many messed up loans, you know, from like Countrywide and NationStar and, and some of these other businesses that are some of these under uh, <clears throat> these lenders that have gone out of business. And uh, they did a very poor job of the paperwork and they knew they would never be able to foreclose. So they would just offer people deals, you know, eliminate a hundred thousand dollars of the debt, uh, you know, give them a modification just to you know, get people paying again so they, they don't lose the whole mortgage. Um, but we don't really see as much of it these days. Uh, I've barely seen um, uh, principal forgiveness and modifications in the last few years. Um, I mean, I don't know about Ms. Torres uh, and, and Ms. Davison, but um, at, le at least from my perspective, I, 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 I barely see that. So someone you walk in the office and they just look at your paperwork and they say, oh yeah, I can, you know, get $300,000 taken off this and we can get it situated. Um, no, it's probably not happening or at least not how they say it. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity uh, with that or even, you know, uh, you know, you know, the quote unquote messed up mortgages. Um, so yeah, those types of situations we see. Um, power of attorney. Now this is a very common one. Um, and these generally involve people closest to you, family members, friends, um, and you know, some people, just people very close to other individuals. Uh, so it's a situation in which let's say you have elderly people, maybe they don't have, uh, you know, may, maybe they, uh, you know, don't have the same uh, mental faculties as they did before, you know, all typical Alzheimer's situation, right? They do a power of attorney or they did a power of, you know, they do a power of attorney, maybe the people in the hospital, you know, they're all there, but they, they do a power of attorney and, and maybe to a family member. The next thing you know, that person with the power of attorney selling the home, uh, you know, and, and running off with the profits. Uh, we had a, a situation like this. Uh, it, it was pretty egregious. These, these individuals walk into my office and actually a colleague, she was sitting with them in a conference room and she brought me in. And, uh, and it was one individual, it was his mother and then the other individual was his grandmother. And the mother gave power of attorney to her sister, so the aunt and the great aunt. And what the aunt did was deed the property over to her son, so their cousin. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe plan to sell it, but, but, but these are very typical situations. You give someone power of attorney, next thing you know, they're selling the home or, you know, the, uh, a very typical situation, right? We think of, you know, the older man deeding it, you know, over to his, young, you know, young home health aide. And then the next thing you know, you know, she's out of the country, you know, with a million dollars and the whole house is being auctioned off or not auctioned off, but, you know, house has been sold, uh, you know, to, like I said, a couple, couple from Ohio. So be, be uh, careful of these situations because this is probably the most common one. It's simple, doesn't require a lot of knowledge. And then a lot of times people are in a position w in which uh, it's hard for them to find out what's going on, right? Like I said, you know, person in the hospital, they're not, you know, you know going over this stuff in the hospital. Um, so it's hard for them to find out. Um, another common type of scam we see uh, or, 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 or that's perpetuated the home repair scam People hold themselves out as contractors. There are a lot of quote unquote contractors without licenses around New York City. They will, you know, maybe even go to people's homes and say, hey, you need to, you need all this work done. Oh, this other contractor, they quoted you $50,000. I tell you what, I'll do it for $20,000. I'll do it, you know, for $10,000. But it's basically a, you know, a nominal, a, 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 a nominal or a much smaller amount. People say, oh, this is great. They'll have them sign quote unquote contracts or stacks of papers. Oh, look, lo and behold, one of those documents is a deed and people don't find out. And, and this goes back to what I was saying before, you know, like the, you know, like the, the, you know, the senior citizens in bed right? Oh, okay. Side of your home isn't looking that great. A lot of people have looked into, you know, making uh, renovations. They can't afford it. And then someone says, oh, I'll give it to you for a cheap price. And next thing you know, they're signing the property over. Or sometimes uh, what these people will do, they'll put an absurdly large like lien on the home um, and, you know, try to try to force people to, uh, you know, sell the home, scare them up to, to try to sell the home. And these people get, a, you know, a, a windfall, a lot of money out of it. Uh, so just be careful of that. Make sure you hire a licensed contractor. Uh, this is what, uh, you know, we always tell our uh, Department of Buildings, our OAF clients, uh, because so many people get violations based upon um, unlicensed contractors.
So, uh, you know, just be, be wary of who you hire in general. Um, next slide, please. Just one thing, we just oh, want to give a plug for that. You know, you hear Mr. White say, um, you know, you get a stack of papers. You want to make sure that when you're working with a contractor, you make sure every page is written on. You do not want to have any blank pages, right? Any blank pages should read left intentionally blank, right? Because that's how they get you. Once they have your signature, then they can go in and fill in any documents. You know, you hear Mr. White talk about um, how your deed is stolen. So one of the things they do is just have the back page of the deed. And all you do is sign that back page. They can then go and fill up the other parts of the deed and then go and register that with the county clerk's office. So any, anyone you're working with, please make sure you always have a third party look over the documents, make sure what you're signing is the exact document that you get a copy of. And the only the reason I'm jumping in here is because we have had that happen to clients who have come in with document documents that they did not sign, right? They never saw that so-called um, home repair contract. And then they, they what the contractor did was fill in another contract put in different amounts than that was agreed to um, by the homeowner and the contractor. And then on top of that, what he did was went and took out two credit cards in the, in the homeowner's name, right? So, you know, we really, really have to be careful when we're dealing with, with people. And so that's why you have an organization like an NHS, uh, a, a Brooklyn Volunteer Lawyers Project that can look over documents for you. So Mr. White, please, take it away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get your slide going. There you go. No All right. So uh, another, another scam we see is uh, the hard money lender. Now, this is a pretty new scam. Um, and I've actually spoken with another uh, a number of other attorneys about it. So generally, when we talk about like, quote unquote, hard money, hard money is a term that investors generally use for the money, so basically a loan they'll take out to fix up and flip a property. So let's say, you know, you buy a, you know, a, I don't know, some dilapidated property uh, for pro probably still a lot of money these days, and you want to fix it up and flip it, uh, flip it in about a six month period. Now, you know, you just don't go, you, you know, is it 1950 where you can just, you know, walk down to the bank and you'll sit with, you know, your neighbor who works at the bank and take out a loan for it and they give it, you know, and they give it to you in short order. So what they'll do, they'll call it their hard money lenders. And these are people who basically they'll give a loan for let's say 10 to 12%. Um, the loan will be for a year. Uh, you pay a lot of money back for them to them, but it doesn't matter if, if you're, if, if let's say you're a, a, an investor or a home flipper, because you know, you just need the money. You're going to pay them back their money quickly and they're going to make a good return on it. And you're going to make a good return on the home. But what some of these hard money lenders have done, they start lending to uh, like residential homeowners. So people actually live in the home. They say, and people say, okay, well, I, I need to refinance the home. You know, maybe mom died, which is a, a very common situation. She had a reverse mortgage on the home. And in that situation, you pretty much have to pay the bank back, uh, you know, soon thereafter or when they find out about the death or they're gonna start a foreclosure action against you. So you say, oh my goodness, you know, my credit isn't that great. I have some tenants in here. You know, my, my credit isn't that great. Um, so I, I can't get a loan. What they'll, people do, they'll go to these hard money lenders. Hard money lenders will say, okay, we'll give you a one year loan at a 10 to 12% uh, interest rate. And we'll give you option for a second year, you know, if we feel like it. And you have to sign the property over in the name of an LLC. So, you know, it's like a shell corporation basically because, you know, most people, they just don't have random LLC sitting there unless they have a real business. And it allows them to get around Truth and Lending Law Act, the Truth and Lending Act, which basically maintains that anytime you are lending or anytime you're borrowing from some entity, they have to provide you, um, they have to provide, they have to disclose uh, all the terms, so all the p uh, fees, penalties for not paying, uh, the, the actual interest rate, all this stuff has to be disclosed. Um, and then also it gets around uh, usury laws. So state usury laws for an individual, 16%. Usury laws did not exist for, uh, for companies because, I mean, I guess the idea is if you, if you take the risk and start a business, you should probably know what you're doing. Uh, and if you don't, then your business fails. 
Um, but obviously, it's a greater risk for uh, homeowners or individual homeowners. Um, and then what happens if the, if the homeowner cannot refinance or pay off the loan in a year, then they'll start a foreclosure action and just take the home back from them. Um, and a number of people have uh, essentially come to our doorstep uh, with this issue, but it makes it harder because technically you're not representing a homeowner. Who you, rep you who would you have to represent? You would have to represent a business. Uh, so be, you know, please be cognizant of this, these issues. And if anyone wants to lend to you and they want you to change title from your name to a business's name, or they want you to start a LLC to change title, uh, do not do it. That is fishy. Do, do not do it because they're probably, uh, you know, they're probably going to take you for a ride. Um, and then also we have the short sale situation. Now, what's a short sale? A short sale occurs in which a homeowner um, sells their, or when a homeowner is underwater, so let's say you owe $550,000 for a home that's valued at $500,000, and they try to sell it. Um, to uh, uh, an arm's length transaction. That means not your friend, not your sister, not your a family member, but it has to be someone you don't know. A lot of times in New York City, it's to an investor. And, uh, and basically the bank says, okay, though you owe us this money, though you can only sell it for this amount, we'll accept that amount. We'll, we'll call it even. Um, you have to move out, but at least you don't owe any more money uh, and they'll stop affecting your credit. Um, now, the thing is, what happens and why short sales are so attractive to people who don't really understand how these things work is because the way short sales are done. So investors, what they'll do, they'll say, OK, this home is worth 500 and you owe 550. OK, bank, we'll make you an offer for three hundred thousand dollars. And then the bank may come back and say, no, we don't want three hundred. We'll take four hundred thousand. And they'll say, OK, fine. $400,000, they'll pay the bank $400,000 because then they know that they can put $200,000 into it, build, you know, one of these um, uh, big apartment buildings that you see, you know, going up where brownstones used to be, and they'll sell them all for, you know, over a million dollars. And they, and, and they, and they, and they dub, essentially, they made a profit of like $600,000. But this is the thing. A lot of homeowners, or what happens under the table is, a lot of these people give homeowners twenty, forty thousand dollars, whereas they would get nothing uh, if if they sold it off. Let's say just to another person that wants to buy it, right? And that's tempting. But what people will do to scam people out of property? Say, okay, you can't keep the home. Well, you should do a short sale. But the thing is, what happens is a lot of people have equity in their homes, especially if you bought the home a long time ago for a few hundred thousand, and now the home is worth over a million dollars. So I have clients that have a million dollars in equity in their home, but some but people are trying to convince them to do a short sale. So these people will basically get a discount and these homeowners won't get any equity. Um, and, you know, that, 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 is, an, that is an issue. Um, but unfortunately, the problem with a lot of these short sales uh, you have wrongdoings all around. Uh, we had one situation, a lady uh, called in complaining that this person agreed to pay her $40,000 under the table for a short sale. The investor, quote unquote, investor paid her $20,000 and then didn't pay her the other $20,000, which was, I mean, illegal anyway. She got mad and she didn't transfer the home to him. And it was just a big mess. But clearly we wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole because there was this wrongdoing and it's wrongdoings and illegalities all around. Uh, but just but be careful of that. Short sale is only when you're underwater. But if you you know you have equity in your home, you, you know you don't need to mess around with a short sale. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Peter, because um, a lot of homeowners do fall prey <laughs> to these um, either realtors or people who walk into their homes and they've already established that they are in foreclosure and at risk of losing their homes and they will make that proposal and not realize that it is illegal to take money if you're petitioning for a short sale uh, transaction. So thank you for highlighting that. That's a very important point for our audience to know. Yes, uh, uh, yes, and yes, again, uh, yeah. Thank you for adding that point in, Ms. Torres. Uh, it, it is illegal to take money under the table for a short sale. Um, I've even, I mean, but people do it so much. I've even had bank attorneys ask me, they say, why do so many of these people want to do short sales? Why do so many of these people want to do short sales? And obviously, I don't want to tell them because that, you know, illegalities are going on. They're getting money under the table. That's, that's 
that's unfortunately the nature of the game in, in New York City. But, uh, you know, be very careful when someone says they want to do a short sale um, because, you know, the, the opportunities for fraud about um, and illegalities all around. Um, the next one, attorney fraud. I, I think I gave everyone a good example of that. You go to the attorney. The attorney says that, you know, he or she is going to do, uh, you know, all this stuff for you. They don't do anything. They rent out your property. Uh, and a lot of times, and I'll tell you this too, there are attorneys who may, um, what they'll do, they'll represent people. They won't provide services. They'll come back in a year and say, hey, look, you know, they're going to auction your homes. Nothing I could do. I work so hard. You should sell it off to this person. And it's number one, it could be an investor who the attorney is getting kickbacks from. You hear of attorneys, you know, they have investors basically on call. Investor buys a property. And investors like, okay, here, attorney, take $25,000 because they're still getting a deal. Or the attorney will actually buy the home themselves. They'll set up an LLC. You don't know who they're actually selling, <clears throat> the, the homeowner is actually selling the property to. They'll get a front person and you're actually selling it to the attorney. Um, so be, careful, be, be very careful of that. Um, and if an attorney does buy your home, I mean, you know, that'd be upfront about it. But you, you, you need to, you know, people need to be very careful of that. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and trusting some, you know, some of these attorneys. Uh, so be, be diligent with that. Uh, another thing, overt deed theft. You know, the classic situation, you know, you wake up one day, you receive, or you wake up one day, you know, you check the Acris website, and lo and behold, there's another deed, um, you know, to, to, you know, 999 LLC, or, you know, to John Doe, and you don't even know who this entity or who this person is, uh, because they forged your signature. Um, I mean, it seems very simple, but let's say, you know, someone's staking out homes and they say, oh, wow, like this home looks abandoned or, uh, you know, it, it you know, looks like elderly people live here. Maybe they won't find out and they'll just take the risk, uh, you know, forge a deed and they'll file it with the county clerk uh, and, and hope nothing happens to them. So that is a, um, you know, the, the that's important. You know, you, you, you must keep track of that. And actually that part brings me to the next part. Um, <clears throat> oh, so actually, well, I'll explain that. Well, I was going to explain later. Um, no, you, you can go back. You can go back. Uh, I'm for it. I'm sorry, for it. You can go for it. If there are no questions. Oh, next slide. So, no, sorry, Peter. There's oh, a yeah. question. My mouse was giving me a little trouble. Oh, there sorry. was one question where someone was asking, is there a time where someone can um, transfer the deed while a mortgage is on a property? Can a deed be transferred when there is still a mortgage on the home without the approval from the bank? And we yeah. get this question a lot. So can you please explain the difference between the mortgage and the deed and you know how, how that works? Okay, so deed is, just think deed titles a property and the mortgage is basically a lean on the property generally to buy it or for home repairs, right? So people actually transfer deeds all the time. I've had clients, like families, uh, you know, clients, and they've, you know, transferred the deeds like they're, you know, passing Skittles, you know, to, to one another. Um, and, and, and it does occur. And then what will happen sometimes, let's say someone wants to refinance, let's say a person says, okay, I, I bought the home, I'm the original homeowner, but, uh, you know, I want to refinance, but, oh, I'm not making the most money right now, or, oh, my credit isn't the best. Oh, but, you know, my, my uh, son or daughter, you know, they have a great job, they have great credit. They'll add them to the deed, and they'll use them to get another mortgage to refinance. So, yes, that is a possibility. Now, I would suggest, I would tell all of you, if you are going to transfer the deed, make sure you pay um, make sure you pay the transfer taxes on it because the, the city, let's say you get violations uh, or let's say you get violations. You say, oh, it was, you know, my cousin owned the home and the cousin transferred it to me. And they'll say, okay, did you pay transfer taxes? No, I didn't pay transfer taxes. Not a valid transfer. You'll get hit with the violation. And just like whenever you buy or sell a home, you pay transfer taxes. So if you're going to transfer the deed um, to make it more official, to make it official, uh, you just don't file it. You better pay transfer taxes. But yes, you can transfer a deed. Without the bank's approval, right? Yes, without the bank's approval. It happens all right. the time. As long as they're getting paid, uh, you know, generally they're, they're, they're happy. Obviously, you know, 
it, it, the situation dependent, but most of the time, you know, they're not going to say anything. They're looking for their money. No, not that stuff. All right. Um, so I'll continue on. So just uh, be cognizant of um, um, new opportunities for fraud in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because just because, you know, as, as you can see, you know, we're, we're on this Zoom meeting, uh, we can't be face to face with people a lot of times. That means people who are not necessarily technologically savvy, uh, which does tend to be a lot of senior citizens, uh, maybe people who, I mean, you know, a lot of people out there who, you know, can't afford computers or just people just aren't tech savvy. Um, um, the opportunities for fraud abound because now it's not like you can say, okay, uh, I think a fraud is going on. Let me go down to the county clerk and see what deed has been filed. You have to do everything electronically. And if you don't know how to work, you know, certain websites um, and um, you just don't have the electronic means to, you know, figure this stuff out, um, your, your reaction time is going to be a lot slower. Um, so, but, <clears throat> but the, there, there are a few types of uh, fraud or potential fraud that we see. So, um, so emails or telephonic directions provide information uh, electronically to the bank. So let's say, you know, classic example, you know, you get a phone call and they say, oh, your bank's calling you or like, the IRS is calling you, you know, please call us, call us back at this number or press one to speak to a representative. And you say, oh, this sounds weird. Banks never called me before. You press one. They say, oh, well, you're behind on this and this. You have to pay this money. Next thing you know, you know, you're transferring some money off. Uh, you know, that you think you're paying on, you know, a mortgage or, you know, some fees, uh, you know, often entity is not the bank, or they tell you you need to do certain things, sign over a deed, and you're doing it because you think it's the bank, but it's not the bank. Uh, scammers are even starting to buy local numbers. So you see a 718, you see a 212, 646, you know, et cetera, uh, still be scams. Um, and also, uh, sometimes they'll send you emails that say, log on to our site. Um, and you know, and and you know, fill out information, put your information in, uh, but you shouldn't do that automatically. Um, you know, if you're used to, you know, maybe paying your mortgage, uh, you know, pursuant to a website or on a website, go to that website. Just don't click on a link. That's, uh, I mean, you know, those are Trojan horses a lot of times, and people get your get your information. They do all sorts of craziness. Um, and also, be careful with online deed filings. Uh, you know, people can file deeds online. Uh, but people of other people, scammers can also file these online. Uh, so you, you you have to make sure you know what's going on uh, with that and being cognizant of that. So can I just share uh, a little story? Oh, sorry, Liz, I didn't see your hand no, up. Go, go ahead. ahead. So, you know, as Mr. White said, you, we do our bankings online and you get information from your bank. So shortly before this webinar started, I got a text from my so-called bank, which never uses the way that this person or entity wrote this text, right? To tell me that my debit card is under review. So know if you have alerts set up on your phones and you get um, email, know how those emails look, know how those texts look, because when these other ones come through, you'll know that this is fraud because your bank never uses certain names, right? So really, thank you, Peter, great information. Yes, um, I, just a I, few, oh, sorry, go ahead, Louis. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to add to the list of um, emails, telephonic um, scams. Um, because of the pandemic, and, and this has happened before, there may be people who are out there who know when someone dies in the family and owns a home. They will contact you. They will, you know, prey on those who are going through a tough time. And that's important to note that you may, you may be approached. If you recently had a death in your family, someone may suspiciously decide they want to knock on your door. They may want to offer services, assist you. Please be careful of that. Be mindful of those uh, scam opportunities. Those unfortunately unscrupulous people do unscrupulous things even at the time, uh, at, at such a sensitive time in people's lives. And that is not uncommon. It's very common for it to happen. So be mindful of that. Yeah, even uh, I'll, I'll tell you, even, you know, anyone's ever gone to a real estate symposium and they, and they tell people at these real estate symposiums, they say, oh, you want to get into flipping homes? 
and people say, okay, you know, how, how do I get into flipping homes? How do I find the homes? Okay, uh, well, you know, email blitzes, you know, send paperwork to these homes, call people up, look at, you know, look at death records, see who died, what home they lived in, you know, did, did they own the home? And then just kind of blitz those people with information. And it's hard to determine who's legitimate and who's a scammer. Um, so don't respond. That's what we always tell people. Um, yeah, next, uh, next slide, please. Just this last part about uh, COVID fraud. Um, also electronic notarization of documents. So uh, they passed a law, Governor Cuomo signed a law at the beginning of the pandemic, allowing for electronic notarization. I haven't seen this yet, but be cognizant of it. That means, let's say I wanted to notarize something for uh, Ms. Torres, uh, we can have a Zoom meeting and she could sign it in front of me, and then I can basically, uh, you know, type my notary information on a document, and it's good. It's not, you know, I don't have to put the wet steel stamp, any, uh, stamp anymore. That means, uh, you know, if you're a scammer, you know, you can forge someone's signature, and it's not like you even need the wet, uh, you know, the wet seal stamp. You know, let's say if it's a fake stamp, it may look a little weird or something. You can just, you know, type type out numbers, and no one may no one may find out. Uh, so be cognizant of that. And um, also scammers, especially, uh, like I said, they're seeking out people with, uh, who may be facing financial setbacks to offer them help uh, to obtain loan modifications. And I mean, remember, it's, uh, you know, because of this pandemic, a lot of people are, are, are not paying their mortgages right now. They're not making money or they're making less money. They're desperate. They, they want to pay their mortgages. They want to get back on track. They want to get back to their normal lives. But they don't have the financial wherewithal to do it. And scammers are uh, searching out these people. And I, I believe the latest statistics showed that uh, the New York State default rate as and the people who are one to three months behind on their mortgages is about 12 percent, 11 to 12 percent. This is the highest, pretty much the highest number in modern recorded history since maybe like the Great Depression. It was only uh, maybe like three to four percent in 2008, 2009. So there are a lot of desperate people out there and there are a lot of scammers uh, you know, looking to take people's homes because they're trying to sell them a dream. Uh, and if it sounds too good to be true, probably does. It probably is. Yes. And and, and just one last part. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just for me to finish up because I know I'm right at uh, right about time uh, for my part. What can you do to prevent fraud? Three simple things. Number one, register for the NYC ACRA system. The ACRA system is where deeds are recorded in New York City. Uh, unfortunately, Staten Island uses a separate system. Uh, but they do have an online system. But the beauty of this ACRA system, you can get notifications via email, you can get notifications via phone call, like an automated phone call saying, you know, check, you know, check the ACRA system, there's been a, a new deed filed, or you can get text messages. So if you're not the most tech savvy, you can still get these phone calls or text messages. Um, and it'll let you know if a deed transfer occurs so you can reach right out to an attorney, a housing counselor, or the district attorney. Um, also, um, first of all, you know, if you think a scam has been perpetuated, call the district attorney's office, right? You want to get them involved because if there is a nefarious party that probably needs to be arrested, uh, th you know, they're the ones to do it. They're the ones to bring up charges and they're the ones who can most quickly get you your home back. But obviously it depends on the situation. If you took $19,000, they're probably going to, you know, they're probably not going to be involved. So you just, you know, find a housing counselor, an attorney, you know, to try to, you know, give you advice. And then also number three, verify, verify, verify. Uh, be careful with people that reach out to you uh, for home related services. They, they just call to make, um, you know, you, you, they just call you, you know, to ask about your home or ask to help you uh, with certain things because they say, you know, say you're going through a difficult time. You need to verify these people are actually calling from the place they're calling from. If they call, they say, oh, I'm from whatever company, sounds like a legitimate company, you know, say, okay, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll call you back and, and make sure you call the, you know, the real number on the company's website. Uh, you know, don't trust those people just randomly calling. Um, and like I said before, if they offer you a deal that seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so just, if you can just go to the next slide, please. And I'm just, um, so on my part, I'd just like to thank the TD Charitable Foundation, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and the New York uh, Bar Foundation. Uh, they, they, keep our light, they keep our lights on, I mean, metaphorically and physically uh, through grants 
Uh, they keep me and, uh, and, and, and a number of uh, housing counselors and attorneys uh, through the city gainfully employed, which is always a good thing. I mean, if we eat, you know, um, you know, we're in a better mood to help you. Um, and so we'd just like to thank them. And then uh, this next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, our contact information for the Brooklyn Bar Association uh, Volunteer Lawyers Project. Uh, please call us or email us. Our address is 44 Court Street, Suite 1206. Unfortunately, we are not in the office uh, at the present moment. As you can see, uh, well, I, I'm at home. Uh, so if you, uh, it, you know, if you need anything, you know, please call us or email us. And, uh, you know, we'll try to get back to you and provide you, uh, you know, at the very least relevant information that can help you in your time of need, because we understand that many people, um, you know, are facing great times of need. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. White, for the great information. You're not gone yet. We have a few questions. It's not a lot tonight, but we do have a few questions. And but before we get to that question, I just want to add one thing because um, we're running up against time. I just want um, to just share, if you're out there and you're someone who is having difficulty with your mortgage, if you're in a forbearance, your forbearance is coming to an end, we're encouraging you to please contact us, right? To talk about what next steps look like for you or what your options are. Right, everyone here that money is coming down from the government. Yes, that is true. We do not know when that money is going to come down, right? We're hearing as far as September. Another thing we don't know is how much money a homeowner is going to receive. So we wanna make sure that we get you in early so that we have you on file. And when the monies do come down, since we're one of the organizations that will be administering those funds, right? You're first in line. We know your situation. We already have you lined up. And please, this other thing about us being ashamed. Yes, we're prideful people. I understand that. But if you don't speak and if you do not seek out assistance, you're not going to get help. You're going to fall prey to what Mr. White just pre presented on, right? Scams. Because when people know that you're, know that you're in, in trouble and when you yourself are desperate, you're going to take whatever help comes your way. And oftentimes it's in the form of scams. So please, 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 we understand pride. We understand being embarrassed because we can't pay our mortgage. Listen, it's not the end of the world. That's why we are here. That's why Mr. White is there, is to protect you and guide you through the process of not losing your home. So please reach out to any organiza um, nonprofit organization, legal service organization that you feel comfortable working with, right? We're all out there in different neighborhoods to assist you. You don't have to fall prey to scam. And so, Ms. Ms. Torres, you have one question? Yeah, I, I, have I just want to add, like. uh -huh. add two things. Um, so in the last slide, Mr. White did mention that um, that if, if, it, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And another rule of thumb to remember is if someone is seeking you and you have not seeked them, mm -hmm. that's also a sign that you may want to look out for. Um, oftentimes, a lot of the scammers do tend to develop relationships with homeowners um, because they're interested in something. Really, you know, you can find someone, you know, who's circling your block often enough and they'll start a conversation. They may already know your situation before they even approach you. And then now you've developed a relationship and you feel comfortable enough to trust them with your financial uh, situation or your foreclosure matters, for example. Um, so you be mindful of that. Anyone who is approaching you may not have your best interest at heart. Um, and the last thing I will add, um, just because you are in foreclosure or in default does not necessarily mean that your lender is going to foreclose on your property right away. In New York State, it takes 18 to 24 months, possibly longer, and it is a judicial state. Therefore, they will not just come knocking on your door and kick you out of your home. So please do reach out to our organization. If you have, um, you know someone or you yourself are in a situation where you need assistance. Thank you, Ms. Doris. Great advice and people, please, please, 
take heed to, to what Ms. Torres said. Um, there is one area that um, we didn't go over tonight, and I just wonder if Mr. White can just speak briefly on it. And that is, um, we didn't speak about compartmentalized deeds, but we won't touch that tonight. Um, but somebody was talking about the third party transfer issue that exists in New York, and we know that's a big issue. If it's something that you can't cover tonight, that's fine. We can always get back to this person with um, some information on that. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, third party transfer is when uh, the de the city deems certain properties as being, uh, you know, derelict, and what they'll do, they'll tran they'll quote unquote transfer the property back to the city, which mo and and then they'll basically sell the property off, or they'll put it in trust. I'm sorry, they'll put it in trusteeship with another company, which a lot of times tends to be a real estate uh, developer. And they've actually there've been protests on this. Uh, there've been like hearings. Uh, with the borough, the the Kings County borough president, and the the problem with it is, where do third party transfers occur? They generally occur in working class black and brown communities. So yeah, we're talking about Brownsville, we're talking about East New York, and a lot of times, even if a um, even if let's say an owner of a building is, may, may have neglected the upkeep, what happens is you have. Uh, tenants who are living in the building, they've lived there for a long time, they put their own money to their apartments, and you know, they get pretty and, and rent is cheaper there. And suddenly you're taking the building away from a lot of these people and then they have to go out in the market and, uh, and, and, and find more expensive uh, places to live. I mean, luckily, third party transfers do not happen uh, a, a whole lot like the numbers aren't very high. But uh, it's, it's something that has been brought to the attention of, you know, the state assembly, uh, the city council and, um, and city government. And it's currently Thank you, on Mr. pause. White. And Ms. Torres, you have your hand up. Do you, you have one question? No, it, it's just currently on pause and well, yeah. hopefully there will be a, a yeah. solution yes. um, to it uh, because it does put a lot of generational wealth for black and brown communities at risk. Absolutely. And there's legislation happening, actually not legislation, advocacy happening around that as we speak. So yes, please, please stay tuned. So two questions. Um, and, you know, we spoke about short sale earlier. I know the answer, but I'm going to let Mr. White answer this one. If I am unable to pay my mortgage and I am behind and my home is upside down, can I sell the property to my daughter? Would that be a short sale? So, all right, theoretically with a short sale, like I said before, it has to be an arm's length transaction. And I know that's a quote unquote legal term of art. All that means is you basically can't know the person or be related or have, a, or you can't have a sweetheart deal, right? So if you're, so in that situation, if you want to do a short sale, no, you could not sell it to your daughter. It has to be a situation in which you sell it to yeah, someone you don't know. So that's why you see people, they'll have like, what's called like short sale, like open houses. So, you know, people come and look around their home and then, you know, they try to come up with agreement in principle, they'll offer the bank money. Um, or, you know, a lot of times, like I said, it's real estate investors because they're the people who just have the liquidity to come up and scoop it. But no, it can't be your daughter, can't be your son-in-law, can't be a family member or a friend. Thanks, Mr. White. But and we also encourage, if that person is actually it, you know, it wasn't just a hypothetical question, but you do need some questions answered around your situation. We do encourage you to reach out to us. We might be able to guide you in the proper direction that you can still keep your home, right? And not lose your house and not necessarily have to do a short sale. Okay. I mean, and, okay. And, and, and I'll say this too. I mean, if you really wanted to do that, a way out possibly could be adding your daughter's name to the deed. And if your daughter has really good credit, try to refinance through your daughter and try to do like a short, what's called a short payoff. So basically payoff, right. say, hey bank, uh, you know, I owe $25,000 more than what the home is worth. I'll give you this amount, uh, you know, keep the, uh, the offer open for 30 days and then you try to get a mortgage or, you know. Or hopefully, right, maybe do an assumption. So that's why I'm oh, saying yeah. reach out to us there, you know, maybe some other options for you out there. Not necessarily that. Um, so this the, the gentleman gave his name, so I, I think it's okay for us to share his information because he's a is an attorney and he has done some great work. And maybe pe it's good, you know, for people to hear his name. And so Mr. Bill Leinhard, he said he was an attorney and he represented one of the homeowners who was scammed by the attorney you spoke about, Peter, 
earlier in yep. the criminal prosecution of the attorney you mentioned a number of main, of main scammers in Brooklyn have been well known to the author, um, authorities for, for years. We have heard that also. So his question to you is, why do you think the scammers have been allowed to persist for so long? And this is a question that we have been asking, that we know they're known. Why is it that you're not doing anything until... Well well, I, I, I think on two levels, I mean, and, and this is just obviously my opinion. Uh, this, is, this is my personal Objective. opinion, right? I don't have yeah. any statistics for this. But I think there's a cultural and there's a social issue. And cultural, I don't mean ethnic cultural, but I think locally, um, you, it, it's been a cultural issue. I mean, gentrification obviously uh, is rampant in a lot of cities, a lot of major cities. I mean, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., which is the most gentrified city in the United States of America. And I think it's been a rush by a city to quote unquote, clean up some of these neighborhoods. And, um, you know, it, I guess it hasn't been seen as a systematic issue until recently, until the last few years. And then also socially, um, I, I believe that you're dealing with people with, how should I say, like different levels of power, right? A lot of times the people being scammed or like I said, they're working class, they're black or brown people, a lot of them are senior citizens, but who are the scammers? They generally have money, um, so, some of them have money because I mean, let's, let's say we talk about the quote unquote real estate investors and you know, not to say anything about the good real estate investors, but you know, some of the quote unquote real estate investors, they have liquidity, you know, they, 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 you know, they come in you know, with nice suits, they're, you know, they're convincing, uh, they sound intelligent, um, and they're in, in the, you know, they're able to, you know, get properties, uh, you know, away from away from people, um, and that's what happens. And then also, you have people, uh, and you know, in, you know, working class people in uh, neighborhoods that were, you know, have been traditionally neglected, and they just may not be that savvy. And I don't mean not, you know, not being intelligent, but they may not be savvy when it comes, uh, you know, to homes and 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 some of the other means to make sure, uh, you know, these scams do not occur. And that's just what it, it, it seems to me. It, it, you know, it's rarely a situation in which, you know, a medical doctor comes in, they say, hey, I, you know, I live in Brooklyn Heights and I've been scammed. It's generally people who are targeted in certain neighborhoods. I mean, most of like 75, uh, 75 percent of, um, you know, our cases come from pretty much five zip codes and they're all in Eastern Brooklyn. So they know what neighborhoods to target, they know what people to target, and they, I think they may have it down to a science in ways. Okay, thanks, Mr. White. Ms. Torres, I see your hand is up. Do you have a question or that, that was the last? No, that was- Okay, that was the last. Funny. Okay, so this takes us to the end of our webinar. I would like to thank all the people who are posting in the, in the chat box, you know, saying thank you and great information. I'm happy that you found it to be great information. And, you know, just please continue to, to, to um, follow us and mm -hmm. attend our webinars and share with your communities, share with your family, share with your friends. That's the only way we can do this together, right? It's, it's not just one hand, it's both hands that can clap. And so we need you all and we do thank you for always, always supporting us. And without further ado, I am gonna ask Miss Laura McKenna to take us to the closing of this webinar. Laura, thank you. Laura, you're on mute. Thanks everybody uh, for coming out and to our speakers tonight who did a terrific job uh, trying to alert everyone who's on the line of the kinds of things that can, can go wrong for homeowners and the way that people lose their homes and uh, what you can do to keep your home. Uh, we do have other events coming up. Several of them actually uh, are a continuation of a series that we're offering on mortgages. The next one is going to be on June 9th. It will be just next week. And it is on after a homeowner dies, mortgages, wills, and trusts. And that this is not a wills and this is not an estate planning event. This is actually if someone in your home has passed, a spouse uh, or other, uh, you're a parent or someone else who's a homeowner and you need help understanding uh, how to settle this estate and what happens when a property is involved in the estate. So that's uh, next week, June 9th at 5.30. After that, we have uh, a mortgage update 
on foreclosure, forbearance, and the moratorium. This is a changing landscape, as you can hear, with regard to what's happening with mortgages and uh, people who have fallen behind. So we hope you can join us for that at the end of the month. That's Wednesday, July 23rd at 6. We're also going to be having a webinar in partnership with the Department of Finance, and that would be Don't Lose Your Home to a Property Tax Lien. Uh, please subscribe to our website to get an alert for when that will take place. We also have other webinars on home insurance. We might be able to save you uh, a few dollars if you take this and certainly let you know what you're buying when you have a home insurance policy. Uh, if you live within a mile of the Brooklyn coastline or any actually New York City coastline, please come to our flood insurance review. That, is, that takes place once a month on the first Wednesday of the month and you will learn uh, very important now, actually, that FEMA has changed uh, what homes are considered to be in a flood zone and how uh, at risk that zone is, and that impacts your need to have flood insurance. So please join us for that. It's a monthly event. Landlord training for those of you who own uh, and live in properties that have uh, two to four units. Uh, we offer that twice a month. Um, there is a fee but you can register and pay through our website. Financial coaching and credit improvement also offered every month. The next one is June 24th at 6th. And then we have a new property management program as was mentioned earlier. We are inviting homeowners and uh, small landlords again up until four units and you do not have to live in the property, but if you are at a point where you feel like you want some help with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it in a minute, but that's gonna be Thursday, June 17th from six till seven o'clock. Again, tonight's speakers are from NHS Brooklyn, Angela Davidson, Program Director for the Foreclosure Intervention Program, Luz Torres, Housing Counselor. And you can see uh, the telephone number to contact us on is 718-469-4679. And of course you can always reach us at nhsbrooklyn.org. And also thank you to Peter White uh, attorney with the Brooklyn Volunteer Lawyers Project. You can reach him at 718-624-3894 or visit their website at Brooklyn V as in Victor, L as in Larry, P as in Peter, dot org. Now breaking news for you, if you are a landlord uh, or if you have uh, tenants, or I'm sorry, if you have friends and family who are tenants and who, who in New York City doesn't, they just announced the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Landlords may apply on behalf of their tenants if tenants have not been paying. There are uh, eligibility criteria that the tenants must meet, but if you visit our website at nhsbrooklyn.org, we just posted uh, a, an article on that in the news section at the bottom of the homepage. And there uh, are also links there for more information as well as how to apply. Again, our property management program, this is new. What we'll help you do is to stabilize your finances, manage upkeep uh, of your home effectively and efficiently, and to retain your property as a family asset. This program will help small landlords who do not, as I said, necessarily have to live on the property, but up to four units with things like help collecting rent, managing tenants, uh, getting referrals to fill vacancies, counseling on operating expenses uh, and equipment purchase, securing estimates for contractors. We do project management. We also offer counseling on refinance, avoiding foreclosure, getting a reverse mortgage, as well as ways for you to learn how to be a better landlord, if that's something that you're interested in, just in terms of your business skills and practical skills for taking care of a property. Uh, also, we are in partnership with the New York State Energy Audits for free weatherization of your home. That would include insulation in your attics and walls, uh, the ceiling of doors and windows where heat and cold can escape. That drives up your utility bills when the, you have those kinds of leaks. Um, refrigerator, freezer replacement, these are all free, but you must be income eligible. So you can contact our colleague, Ms. Cummings, there at a Cummings at nhsbrooklyn.org or call us at 718-469-4679 to reach Miss Cummings to ask her more about the free weatherization program. Again, you have to meet income eligibility requirements. 
uh, it had we are now in hurricane season which started June 1 so please be prepared for emergencies and disasters start with having a bag that you are can easily grab and go with that has essentials think about this like you're going to be spending a few nights away um, uh, at a sleepover and there are certain things that you want in there and plus if the lights go out you're going to need a flashlight uh, maybe a bottle of water maybe a mask maybe gloves other kinds of things every go bag is a little different but just make sure that you have um, copies of important documents or have them on a little removable drive uh, you have a little money in there you have some id um, uh, and prescriptions and glasses that's always good to have in your go bag um, set meeting places where you're going to meet if you think for example let's say there's a huge fire on your block several buildings are are going up in flames and you need to meet your family members someplace, pick a place that's a couple of blocks away, make sure everybody in the household knows and that that's where you're gonna go if you cannot return immediately to your property. Then pick another place that's maybe a mile away, a library maybe, or some other public place that, you're, that everybody knows and everybody has agreed that's where we're gonna go if we can't meet at our meeting place a couple of blocks away. Uh, and maybe you have some place that's out of area that you go to, too. My husband and I actually have some place out on Long Island we would go and also some place in New Jersey where we, where we would go. Know when to evacuate and when to stay. New York City Emergency Management has just changed the evacuation zones. And so please go to Know Your Zone. That's this multicolor uh, sort of rainbow looking icon that you see there. If you Google Know Your Zone, NYC, it's going to bring you to a website and you can look up your address and find out what your new zone is going to be. Know your risks. Stay with us at nhsbrooklyn.org. We have a lot of emergency preparedness events that we offer uh, and follow us also on social media where we post things very frequently and in a timely way. Put some apps on your phone. For example, Notify New York is one that, that you can put on your, on your phone. Ready NYC is another one. You will get alerts if something is happening in the city that is dangerous and that you, sh you should know about. Okay, last thing almost is going to be just talking about COVID and staying safe from COVID-19, which is still circulating. There are new variants actually that are circulating and the vaccine will you protect you from those. Uh, if you have a vaccination, you are less likely to get seriously ill, less likely to die, less likely to give the, va give the uh, virus, less likely to get it, and if you get it, less likely to have long-term effects. People do not die of this vaccine. If people have died after the vaccine, it is a coincidence. It is not due to the vaccine. So please get vaccinated. Everyone over 12 can get a vaccine. There are many, many walk-in locations all over the city. If you are homebound and can't get out, you can call 877-829-4292. That's 877-829-4692 to uh, have someone come to your home. FDNY will come to your home and they will give you uh, a vaccine if you are uh, 65 and older and you are homebound. In fact, they have gotten to the point now where if you wanna find out where you can get vaccinated, you can text your zip code to 438829 that's 438829. And you will immediately, if you text your zip code to that number, you will get a reply of the uh, some locations in your zip code where you can get vaccinated. Uh, you can also, if you need it, you can get childcare. If you need childcare in order to walk out and get vaccinated. And also if you need a ride, they have an agreement with uh, Lyft to take people to and from vaccination sites. Now, if you're not vaccinated, I mean, it's going to be a while before you can get vaccinated and you feel sick, please get tested. If you've had close contact with someone who has had COVID, please get tested. If you've attended a large indoor gathering of 50 or more people, please get tested both before and you go to those events. You can find a test site by going to nyc.gov slash COVID test or by calling 877-829-4692. So again, thank you very much. Please complete that snapshot survey at the very end of the webinar, which will appear after we close out. And also do subscribe to nhsbrooklyn.org for alerts about future events and other important housing news. 
Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, everyone.